Okay, uh, that's much better. Okay, so uh, we just uh, had a discussion about uh, second machine age and uh, work of AI. We'll be continuing that, how to put that AI to work with Professor Ito, who is director at MIT's Media Lab and who has recently started a $27 million funds with, uh, in collaboration with Harvard to study AI and the social impact of that. It is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Ito. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, so we've got a great panel, and part of the program is going to be with people starting out explaining partially what they're doing, what they're interested in, so I'm not going to go into uh, each of their bios. Um, but let me just start out with a, with a few thoughts about this panel, and then I'll hand it over to Josh, and then we'll go down the line. Um, but uh, I don't know how many of you have read the book, The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos. It's a, it's, a, it's a somewhat technical, but I think it's the best overall book that I've read. But there's a great quote in it that says, people worry that computers will get too smart and take over the world. But the real problem is that they're stupid and they've already taken over the world. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that helps frame I, kind of where I think at least the beginning of this conversation should be, which is that you know, a lot of people talk about this existential risk of AIs coming and thinking humans are a bad idea and making us house pets and all these other things. But in fact, we have machine learning. And it's funny also the definition of AI. This panel uses AI. But AI is often described as the thing that we haven't been able to do yet. <laughs> right. And then we often talk about machine learning or other things as the stuff that we're actually doing. I want to focus on stuff that we're actually doing or that is likely to happen very soon. Because I think those are the things that we really uh, have to work on, both from a business perspective and a, a, um, uh, uh, a regulatory perspective. There's a really interesting, uh, uh, in, in, in Lawrence Lessig's book, um, uh, Code, there, he, he draws a diagram of, of four quadrants with law at the top, uh, architecture, technical architecture at the bottom, and then markets on one side and norms on the other. And those are the four things that affect you, policy, whatever. So you can try to create laws that affect things. You can change technology to affect things. The norms in society affect things. And the markets can affect things. And, and those all relate to each other. But that's how we sort of move forward on ideas like, uh, 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 let's say, autonomous vehicles. Um, one of our faculty members, Yad Rahwan, in our lab did a survey of people. And uh, the, the, the result, it was sort of this trolley problem um, trade-off thing. And the result was. Most people believe that it was moral for a car to sacrifice the passenger to save more lives. Okay. Um, but they said they would never buy that car. <laughs> um, but everybody else should. And, uh, but, but the other thing they said is that government should not force that as a regulation. So that's an interesting conundrum, where the majority of people polled believe society should be one way. Mm -hmm. But it's telling us that markets um, and government laws, those two together aren't going to solve, or at least aren't going to create the world that they believe is morally correct. So, so one of the things I think that we work a lot at um, MIT on is uh, thinking about how do we bring these pieces together to try to design something that is optimized for society rather than just optimized for the market or just optimized for, for the regulators. And so I want to sort of hit at least some of those topics as we uh, go into these things. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll, 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 I'll say is, um, um, you, you know, we, there, there, since the very beginning of AI, there's always been sort of augmentation versus automation. And that's still, I think, very much in the conversation. And many of the tools that we're going to talk about today are sort of augmentation and some of its automation. I think the risk, I'm on the augmentation side, because the risk of automation, even when it looks like augmentation, like risk scores that allow judges to offload responsibilities to a computer that may not even be doing a better job, but just alleviate the risk, or uh, even driving decisions. If your agency, as a drone operator or a driver, is just to push the button, 
which is just yes to the recommendation of the machine, you have given up agency and handed it over to a machine. And that, to me, is a kind of automation. Augmentation is something different. Augmentation is like VisiCalc. It's here's a bunch of creativity that I couldn't have done in the past, but now these tools allow me to both understand more of what's going on, but also contribute my and enhance my creativity. And so I call this the VisiCalc versus dollhouses problem. I'd rather have uh, Legos than a dollhouse. And VisiCalc was a great program for me because it was very generative. And I think a lot of the AI solutions that I see, and I might poke on some of you on this, tend to want to give people solutions. They're like, hey, doctor, give me your data, give me your problems, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> and I don't think that's an optimal collaborative uh, future between uh, humans and machines, which is, I think, going to be the way we get these four <coughs> sectors to work together. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Josh to talk a little bit about. OK. Great. So, so uh, my name is Josh Tenenbaum. I'm a professor here at MIT in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science, but also in mm -hmm. CSAIL, the Computer Science and AI Lab, as well as the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. And I really do two kinds of things. I am, a, I would say, first and foremost, a cognitive scientist. I try to reverse engineer how intelligence works in the human mind and the brain using state-of-the-art tools from engineering. And then kind of as an interesting byproduct, which might be extremely valuable technologically and economically, <laughs> um, try to engineer more human-like learning, reasoning systems in machines. And though we're focusing here on the near term, what matters, I, I think, for, for business, I, I do want to start with a longer term sweep. It's, you know, AI is everywhere. I'm sure everybody knows that uh, it's a decades long story. And it's really quite striking that the techniques which are driving progress most right now, so called deep learning techniques, for example, in particular, are really based on ideas of studying how the brain and the mind work that go back decades. So it's a, it's a great success story for that bi-directional bridge between science and engineering, right? Basic principles of hierarchical structure in cortex um, that were elucidated in the 60s and 70s. Now they have reached engineering maturity. They can be deployed by Google, Facebook, these companies that these guys are <laughs> doing, for example, and it's, it's amazing. At the same time, we still don't have real AI, and we still don't understand how the brain and the mind work. So I think it's important to recognize the gap, too, and that's a lot of what I think about. Um, what's the difference? What are the places that AI is really making progress on right now? And what are the bigger things that we won't expect to see you know, out in the marketplace for at least a decade, if not more? And I, I, I want to just put out a, a distinction here, which I think is useful, which is the difference between pattern recognition and what you could call model building. Right now, the parts of the brain we understand well and the parts that we can engineer into machines are the pattern recognition parts, right? Um, but there's so much more <laughs> to intelligence. I think about how children actually learn, most of which is not really driven by pattern recognition. There's a lot of what we call one-shot learning. So children, for example, can learn a new concept from just one instance, not hundreds or thousands of examples. Or just the ability to just be clueful, to understand the physical things around you, the people next to you. You know, uh, let, you know I've, I've been on the stage one or two times before in my life, but you know, the first time you're in a context like this, you sort of know what to do. There's people next to you, right? If somebody was having a, an emergency in the front row and said, help, and nobody was doing anything, I might get up and climb down off here and go and help you, right? Like, no, I mean, anybody who knows about robots, no robot is just going to do that, <laughs> right? So what is, that's, you know, what is the magic, which isn't just magic, it's actually engineering. Engineering. What is the thing that goes on in the brain and the mind that lets that happen? Well, I'm, this isn't a technical talk. I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm just going to say that's what we work on. But I think it's interesting at, that the places where AI is having an impact in the marketplace right now, things like computer vision or natural language processing or you know, other kinds of robotics and self-driving cars, what, if you really look at the problem there, all these problems, you see both of these things. There are aspects of visual scene understanding that are kind of just pattern recognition, like face recognition, and that is already working. But there are other parts, like just the ability to have a common sense understanding of a scene you've never been in before that is really quite far from being deployed in industry right now, or in natural language processing. You know, we're starting to see systems that can do kind of question answering, because with enough data, you can recognize patterns in the questions that people ask and the kinds of answers that they think are good. But that's very different from actually a machine that you can really have a conversation with, 
right? Particularly on a topic that hasn't already been had by other people, <laughs> right? Or in autonomous driving, right? A lot of what you do when you're driving is basically kind of almost instinct, right? You can have a conversation with someone. But sometimes, this actually happened to me just on the way in today, right? Just literally on the way in today, where there was a, a truck parked here, and there was a cop, or actually it wasn't a cop, it was a construction worker telling some people to stop and other people to go. And I actually had to stop, you know, turn off the radio, put down my cell phone or whatever, and actually pay attention and think what was going on, right? So what I think we're going to see is you know, a, a long tail phenomenon in all of these areas where in the near term, the parts of these things that can be turned into pattern recognition are, are, already, are, you know, are starting to be and are already going to be deployed in all of our businesses. But, but it's not like humans are going to be replaced in any of these areas because there's this long tail that we're still trying to understand. And so just as Joey said, it's going to be a process, I think, of augmentation and thinking about what are the creative ways for the humans who will increasingly be able to focus on the interesting and actually most economically valuable long tail parts of these problems if, they can, if we can come up with the right systems to get them to work together with the machines that are handling the pattern recognition parts. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ali Azerbaijani. I, I did my PhD here at MIT at the Media Lab. I'm currently CTO and founder of uh, Kojiro Corporation. Our fundamental technology is behavioral analytics and specifically uh, speech and conversational analytics. So what, what we do is, is we understand in conversations not only the content of what's being said, but how it's being said. And that's really important because a lot of the meaning and intent behind a conversation uh, happens in the, in, the, in the behavior, not necessarily uh, in the words. Um, the, the main application of our technology is in large call centers, sort of Fortune, Fortune 100 type of call centers, where th these corporations use their call centers as a very important uh, interface to their customers, yet they have they have practically zero information about what's going on in those call centers and very little ability to be able to improve on those interactions. And so that, that's where our, our applications come into play. Uh, we, we're able to listen in real time to 100% of the conversations going on in these call centers, provide real time monitoring analytics to supervisors, but also provide real time coaching to the agents, so it's, it's a matter of, of not only measuring but also intervening and, and helping improve in real time. So, so we're very much on the side of, of augmentation where we believe that these technologies where they are right now are, you know, can really have the, the best effect as sort of an augmented intelligence, sort of a coaching presence, uh, you know, extracting information and, and presenting it to people to help them be better versions of themselves. And, and, and that's, that's where, uh, where we're applying stuff right now. So in, in, in our case, uh, with, with call centers, uh, the, the technology helps improve the conversation. So that's obviously better for, uh, for the customers who are calling in. Uh, having that assistance is helpful for the, for the agents who are on the call. And of course, it's helpful for the organization because they can measure and, uh, and help intervene. So, so that's, that's our business, and that's, our, um, and that's a little bit of our philosophy, too. We're very much on the side of uh, we believe our tools are not, are not going to replace humans, but really help them uh, do the jobs that they do better. Hi, I'm uh, Seth Early, and I'm uh, founder and CEO of Early Information Science. Uh, we're a professional services firm that has been doing work in the area of information management and knowledge management and content management, data management for over 20 years. We take a knowledge engineering approach to the problems we solve. And it's interesting, you mentioned Pedro Domingo's uh, book, Master Algorithm. He says that a knowledge engineering approach is, is, is uh, ill-conceived, right? It's, it's, it's not the right way to, to go about this. And I completely disagree with this. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about training AIs, training the tools, what are you training them with? Yeah. You're training them with knowledge, content, and data. And you have to engineer that. Uh, I wrote an article called, There's No AI Without IA. There's no artificial intelligence without information architecture. There's a copy of that article uh, at, the, uh, at the booth outside, if you'd like to pick that up. And the, and the idea is that there's no magic. 
right? There's no magic. And when vendors will say, oh, you don't need to do any of that. You know, our tool does all of that. Well, somebody made those decisions when they wrote the application. You still have to have data. You still have to have uh, the architecture. By the way, do you, you do know how you can tell when a vendor is lying? And you watch very carefully, their lips are moving. <laughs> all right, it's an old one. All right, all right. Okay. But, but I think the, 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 the challenge that CIOs have today, the challenge that any organization has today is how do you get there? How do you get there? We're, 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 today we have to solve these problems that are very pressing, they're very challenging, it's very difficult, yet there's this vision of the future where everything's going to change, right? But how do you get from, from here to there? And, and our work, uh, we're actually working with uh, a call center services company. Uh, actually, uh, the C CTO is here, uh, Henry Truong. We're working on their digital worker roadmap. They have 110,000 call center seats. They know they are going to be disrupted, absolutely going to be disrupted. And what they're trying to do is disrupt themselves. So how do you do that? You have to do that by looking at the processes that you can automate, but still have the human engage. Machines simplify, humans engage, right? So it is an augmentation process. It really is, you're building a centaur, right? You're building a, 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 a and, and the other part about uh, AI is, you know, I think you mentioned this, I, I heard a great fr uh, quote from one of the MIT uh, instructors uh, in an AI course, I don't remember who it was, AI by definition doesn't work. Because as soon as we, as soon as it works, it gets co-opted by another field, and they call it something else, right? So it's embedded in all of these things that we take for granted. Word processing was, was, it, was an AI application back in the day because it took human judgment and human expertise and it embodied it in these rules. So you know, we have it in our smartphones, we have it in our applications. So on the one hand, there are data science applications where you really need the data scientists, right? You really need the technical folks. On the other hand, there are things that are, that are invisible. So now the question is what's in between? Right? And how do you get there? And that's where that augmentation comes, comes to play. So getting your ho data house in order, getting your content house in order, building ontologies, building information architectures, that's all stuff that has to be done today anyway. You need that now to solve problems today. And you will absolutely need it to, to get to this next uh, evolution, this next iteration, because the, there's no magic. Mm -hmm. right? you, you're not gonna say, oh, well, I'll just wait and maybe these problems will go away. <laughs> <laughs> That's not people tried that with the internet. They tried that. <laughs> it's a fad. Yeah. This internet thing, it's going to be big. <laughs> Thank you, sir. R Ryan, you want to? Sure. So my name is Ryan Garpy. I'm the CTO and co-founder of ClearPath, as well as one of our spin-off companies called Auto Motors. Fundamentally, one of the, the largest things we've been working on these days is deploying fleets of self-driving vehicles into industrial applications. So into factories, into warehouses, starting with materials movement, but obviously there's, there's broader goals beyond that. We do believe that in the long term, the promise of robotics and autonomous systems can make a lot of what we tre uh, presently believe as is low value work just a thing of the past. So we focus on materials handling in warehouses right now because generic materials handling usually takes up to between about 30 and 75% of any item's cost. Any item that you buy, you're paying between 30 and 75% of a tax just on people who move it from point A to point B. Not assembly tasks, just that physical motion of items from point A to point B. So we think it's, very, it's an ideal place. And with the advent of and progress in AI and robotics, it's now become feasible to deploy these systems in, in brownfield applications in, to work in and around people as opposed to being fenced off. And that's provided almost too many applications, too many potential applications for us to count. And I think taking, taking from that, I'd say that the one caution which I might bring forward, um, possibly less, uh, um, along the lines of, of the, the vendor caution is to, uh, is, to be, is to set expectations correctly. When you are working within your organization and exploring this technology, uh, similar to what Josh was saying about the things that AI can do right now, it's making a ton of progress in pattern recognition, but in, in world building and understanding the world, not so much. And we've seen um, examples in the past 
in other areas of technology where these expectations have been set so high and then entire industries will start discarding that technology. The mining industry is a good example of this. Mining robotics was, I think, set a setback a, a few decades ago when people set these very high expectations of fully automated mines within five years and then nothing happened. So I think that's something that we need to collectively be careful about is there's a tremendous amount of potential in AI, but let's not go saying that it's gonna solve every problem without human intervention, for example. This is something that we do very early on when we go into factories, is we go into factories and say, we are striving to achieve human level performance in materials transport, but we're not there yet. You're gonna have to help the robot through some situations. It's gonna get occasionally confused because there's an infinite variability of environments that we're deployed in. Um, and we're not allowed a safety driver, right? If you have a safety driver, it, the value proposition disappears entirely. But you still need to have someone periodically checking in on the systems. And, um, and it's important to set those expectations no matter which field you're in. There, there's a, a name for that. It's called Amara's Law. Apparently, Amara was the first person who said that technology, um, people tend to over estimate short-term impact and underestimate long-term impact. And I think it's sort of a general rule, and I think we're sort of, it's, you know, there's also the Gartner hype cycle. It's hard to tell exactly where we are on the cycle, but we're somewhere on that cycle, and I think, <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, this is, I'm gonna go off script a little bit, because I, I, I have been talking to see, I was looking at these questions and just listening to what you guys just said. You know, I, I do think that, uh, um, you know, without saying any vendor in particular. I mean, I think the, the, the interesting thing, and we'll use that Lasigian thing where oh, the name names. names. Go ahead, yeah. name <laughs> names. Because <laughs> there's some names in the questions. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, because there's a business model, right, yeah. that, that people need to create a product that has, that is sticky, right, that um, provides a solution without making it so much of a solution that the vendor is no longer necessary. And I think one of the tricky things is that, you know, it's basically vendor lock-in, right? And, and I think that, um, so there's one piece like that, and then, but the problem with AI that I've noticed is that, at least in the short run, and, and Josh can also talk about this too, so this is, the question really is, so first of all, when I talk to CAOs, they're having a really hard time finding talented people. The Googles and the Facebooks and the IBMs are paying lots of money to hire most of the best students, and the ones that don't go to those big, high-paying companies either do startups or stay in academia, they're pretty hard to get for a normal company, for a normal CIO. And so unlike some of the other more mature computer science areas, it is harder to make that decision of build or buy. And so I think one of the things that these vendors have is they kind of have a, a, a little bit of a lock-in on talent. So one question is, how's that talent availability curve going to evolve? I hope that the tools become a little bit easier so that you don't have to be uh, you know, a PhD in order to train a machine. And maybe the vendors will, there'll be competition that will create people who will create tools that are more consumable and trainable and usable by experts in the field rather than experts in, in machine learning and engineering. But, but kind of including the time scale and the, and the reality of this problem and where you guys fit into that, can you, because I, I think for, if I were a CEO, that, this is kind of what I need to know, right? Do I, do I have a shot at hiring the right people and building at least some of this expertise internally, or do I have to be dependent on a, a network of vendors? It's a, good, it's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. I, can I just okay, jump yeah. in and say one thing, which is to echo Excellent. some of the things people were saying, what you were saying and what you were saying, and finding those together. The, like, <laughs> like the, this, this narrative that expert systems were the thing of the past is completely false. I g completely agree yeah, with you. Okay. All the AI things right now are expert systems. Right. They're built in a somewhat different way. Yes. They're not trying to like consciously extract experts' verbalizable knowledge for the most part. But they're built by teams of two kinds of experts, machine learning experts and domain experts, right? Like you can't build a, a, a serious, you know, self-driving car kind of thing without like really knowing something about driving. <laughs> you can't like, you know, somebody's asking on the thing about deep mind, you know, you can't build a machine that were built that beats the world's best Go players without thinking hard about Go <laughs> and thinking hard about deep reinforcement learning. So that, that does pose an interesting challenge. And I think, you know, I actually work a lot with Google and IBM Watson teams. They fund some of our research, we collaborate. There's some great researchers there, but they also have, they have their own crises, <laughs> right? Which is that, you know, to actually, they, they're also, I mean, the, the, ta the talent thing you're talking about is, is a huge one. It's, it's true 
they, they, they also don't think they can compete for, for enough. And to do something useful in a particular business application, they actually have to know something about that business. None of these tools are out of the box uh, tools. And they're going to be, there's always gonna be human designers in the loop, um, not just humans in the loop when the system you know, does something unpredictable, but, but as, the, as the problem landscape, even the problem of like moving stuff around in a warehouse, that will keep changing, the problem will keep changing. So you'll keep needing, needing human experts who understand the issues of material transport and robotics to keep improving these systems to adapt in a changing landscape. It's not the systems themselves that are adapting. Uh, in, in, in our business, uh, you know, to build the technology that we build, we need experts in speech science, in behavioral science, in computer science, and you know, machine learning. Yeah. So one of the things that, that makes our company unique is that we've been able to assemble that community of, of experts to be able to build the, uh, you know, the behavioral analytics that we do. I, I, I don't know that, I mean, just looking at our technology in particular, I, I don't think that's something that, a, that people are going to, that companies are gonna do for themselves. You'd have to have a very specialized company like ours to, to build that and provide the tools in some in some way that people can use. Mm -hmm. But, but by, providing, by providing the service and the platform, some of, some of our customers are actually using our system then to, uh, you know, as, as inputs into their own data science to understand, well, if we have these conversational analytics and we add them to other properties about people, then what can we figure out about people? So, uh, so I think that's, uh, I think where I would come down mostly on that question is that you're not going to be building you know, specialized intelligence systems. Uh, but, but do you think you're creating the ability of the customer to cultivate internal expertise on machine learning using your tool? I, I don't think that's the do point of, of this. Yeah, I don't think that's the point of our tool. If, if we do our job right, then, right. then we can provide uh, we can provide systems that are trained to do, you know, to well, do particular tasks. Well, but there's a, th so there, so because if you're the designer of an enterprise, mm -hmm. okay. you kind of have to start to understand what your tools are. Like the internet, let's, the internet's the greatest example. So if a CEO has no clue, mm -hmm. newspaper company, no clue about the internet, they just leave it to the MIS department who then outsources it to some big IT company, they're never gonna be able to innovate, right? So, so my, my point is not that they need to be engineers, right. but they really need to deeply understand the tool, otherwise they're just gonna be getting solutions from you, right? Yeah, I, 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 totally, I totally see where you come from, and I, I think it's an incredibly important uh, question. Uh, it, part of it is a maturity curve of the enterprise, right? Remember, <laughs> organizations didn't have a lot of internal expertise around uh, user experience and building internet applications, but now look at, you know, these, you, you find financial services companies buying user experience companies, right? So they're building that capability. I totally agree that there's a certain amount that you have to have internal in order to innovate. You, you, you're, you can't get locked into vendors in such a way that you're totally dependent on that, and you're outsourcing it, because you can't outsource the innovation, right? right. And so, so part of this is saying, what part of a problem are you trying to solve, right? What's important to your business? Are you trying to reinvent your value proposition mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore really need to innovate very, very deeply about the entire business model and the entire uh, uh, value chain? Or are you trying to make use, or is your core competency more about the subject area and you just need to get the best out of a platform? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so part of one question is, I need to really get good use out of a platform that I need to configure versus develop. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's deciding what problem you're trying to solve let, let, and what let skill me, Let me just you give you a specific Please. example. So, so we have um, these risk scores being created by machines, mm -hmm. okay? And judges, prosecutors, and parole boards are now using the risk score, mm -hmm. right? And the risk score is being generated by a machine that's right. designed by, by people somebody. from DOJ and other people. Yeah. So there are some domain experts in the design, right. but the judge who gets the risk score of nine for Ali and says, you know what? Too bad. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Ali. He or she doesn't know how that data got in and how the algorithms work. And right now, the interface doesn't provide any more detail than a number. And to me, that's a solutionist approach. And what that doesn't do is it doesn't give the judge any insight mm -hmm. into what's going on in the machine. And thus, 
give any insight on how to change the system. So, so that's, that's my concern, is like that some of these Oracle-like solution companies that just yeah. want to pop up. Now, having well, said that, if you have a piece like logistics where, no, this doesn't, okay, we, we just want this to work better, right. I think that makes sense. But, and, and in the early phase, I think a lot of it is just making the system you already have more efficient. Right. But the next phase is always going to be, then now that's done, how do we innovate? And yeah. if, unless you understand, I don't think you innovate. Yeah. Yeah, so so let, me, let me give you some examples for, from our technology. So we actually have two kinds of, two kinds of scoring that we, that we give our customers. Um, one kind of scoring is, is a sort of composite score that, that you're right. You have to kind of understand a little, a little bit of it. Those scores we only give to supervisors. Mm -hmm. because we need to train them to understand what that means and how to react to it and how to use it. And they're generally most valuable in aggregate mm -hmm. because you can, you can get statistical inferences and know, you know where to focus uh, attention, for example. Um, to, to agents, to individual agents, we give a different kind of feedback. We give very, uh, very concretely actionable um, information like, like you're talking too fast or you're interrupting people or things like that. And that's, that's the value of being able, uh, you know, part of our value proposition is that we can do this in real time, so we can provide interventions uh, in one way, but we can also provide information uh, in another way. So I think, uh, so I, 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 I take your point on that, that, that and, and we, we've always struggled with that in, in our product, mm -hmm. is that we, we don't want to just push out a, a number or a dummy light <laughs> that says, you know, this is a bad thing or this is a good thing, because uh, you, you, you run the risk of, of losing trust with, with your users if it turns out that, that that's not actually 100% accurate. And none of this stuff, you know, statistically is 100% accurate. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to interpret human behavior. So, it, so you know, that's how Establishing that's trust is really important. There's research on this, right? It's, it's, uh, the so-called algorithm aversion literature, right? Like, people are happy to trust algorithms as long as they're doing the right thing. But if they give you some, if, if they make a mistake once, yeah. then people will back off and say, well, I guess, it, I, guess it, I can't trust it anymore, <laughs> right? So, you know, things like how do you give insight into what the algorithms are doing, mm -hmm. get more of a real feedback loop there, as you're sort of suggesting, and how do you build that in, in the context of, like, this real-time interaction? I think that's really really important. Ryan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was coming back to the original thrust of the question here, which is where do these people come from? Mm -hmm. You know, we're generating, there's, there's a lot of smart people graduating with, with doctorates. They're getting snapped up by IBM and Google. And some of you, I'm sure, are in this room, so congratulations. <laughs> uh, but, but there have been a few other initiatives meant to solve that. So um, I'm from... Uh, north of the border, slightly. And one of the things that, that we've done, and I say we more as a, as a, as a, as a country, is, <laughs> is we've put together recently a number of initiatives, the Pan-Canadian AI, AI in, um, Initiative, the Vector Institute. All of these things are meant not only, like, first to continue to progress fundamental research. So, you know, Jeff Hinton, for instance, is coming back to Toronto to help run this institute and move these things along. Um, Richard Sutton, um, Yeshua Bengio, they're all very, uh, people very deeply involved in the, this new AI renaissance are all staying and doing the fundamental research. But the other thing that's being done is providing the ability for people who are not necessarily AI scientists, if I can use the term, to get trained up on the tools. So um, undergraduate, uh, undergraduate options and majors in with a focus in this area are being planned for right now. Um, we're planning for uh, we're planning for intensive courses for software engineers to spend a two week intensive learning about a tool like something like uh, like TensorFlow, for instance. Just get, go through this and and be taught by people who actually know what they're doing and understand the background. And one of the other things that's happened is the private sector is being engaged. So we're talking about banks and other, comp uh, other companies like that who aren't their traditional self-driving vehicle or, or other um, you know, large computer firms. Um, they're also getting involved here. So they're sponsoring these initiatives. They're, they're co-sponsoring it. And that gives them the ability to help engage with these, these customers. 
Are, are you? Uh, are you part? I mean, I think that's that's great. Are you part of the Vector Institute, yes, for example? Yes, yeah. Ma'am. So I mean, I so just to echo that, I think Canada is way ahead of the U.S. here, <laughs> and we we need to catch up. So at MIT, we're start we're thinking about that. You know, we we know about the Veterans Institute. <laughs> Several of our former graduates are some of the founding academic partners, and I think yes. it's a great thing. So I you know I think MIT needs to consider doing something like that. It's Boston Cambridge needs it. The United States needs something like that. Not to mention other parts of the world, and and that it's this is not these are these are institutes engines to not just drive research and to not just drive innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that's another great angle of a place like the Vector Institute at Toronto. But just as you're saying, to, to really much more broadly disseminate the skill set and the tools to the, the whole industry community. Um, I will actually say on that for anyone who's interested in learning more mm -hmm. about it, it is open to, um, to US-based companies. The mm -hmm. only condition is that you establish yeah. an AI lab in the area. In Toronto. So in Toronto or locally. Good condition. So it's a good condition. We like it. So this is, for instance, why Uber has spent $5 million recently putting it into the Vector Institute, mm -hmm. um, working with Raquel on self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to bring her south of the border. She says, no, I'm staying up here. I'm doing okay. this work. Mm -hmm. And if you want to work with me, you're investing it. So mm -hmm. there's been a number of inquiries there. And that's the general, um, that's, that's the general approach. Being Canadians, we're very open. To working with anyone, um, but there is a condition. And very nice. They're very nice to work with. <laughs> we have learned there is a condition. <laughs> and, and, and so, bouncing off of that, I think so. I think we we missed. It. You may have seen some of it, but I think the panel before this was the uh, Eric and Andy show on the future of work. And um, I think uh, it will be great if we completely contradict them. But I, I I can sort of imagine what they have have said. What would you like us to contradict? <laughs> but 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 but, but, I, but I think we can tie to that a little bit, bouncing off of what you just said, which is, you know. There's this fear that uh, machines will eliminate all of our jobs. And at some level, machines will eliminate certain jobs. But as we've seen in the past, lots of new jobs get created. Uh, and in the internet, the jobs that got created, like eBayers, I mean, you couldn't have imagined it when you were building the internet. And so my personal concern is that the fear of losing jobs will push us away from deploying or learning about machines and will actually uh, diminish the ability to come up with the new jobs that we have opportunities to create. And, you know, and some of the jobs will be horrible jobs, where you're just pushing the button that the machine is telling you to push. <laughs> and some of the jobs might be great jobs, like uh, pharmacists who can now become doctors with one year of community college because they're augmented. You know? And so, so I'm, I'm curious, first of all, sort of with, with some time scale in mind, and sort of this institute and others, and both at, at the individual level and at the corporate sort of innovation level, you know, where are the opportunities? When's it going to happen? And how do we need to approach it? Because, because, because again, I think like the internet, there used to be conferences just about the internet, and there were like internet specialists. But right, now right. there's, it's always internet it's website design, internet da da da. And so I think machine learning and AI will become that way. But how how do you see that? Developing, are you guys optimistic, blah, 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 just so on, on that notion of the future of work and how do we, because I think we have to lean yeah. into it. You know. yeah. if, I, if I could, I'll just start with my thinking on this. Uh, imagine at the turn of the century, uh, we, we, we started to use mechanized equipment, steam shovels, and people would say, oh my god, all those ditch diggers are going to be out of work. Mm -hmm. Well, then we got to build cities, right? So, so the capabilities that we're developing are going to lead to, to things that we can't even imagine, as you say. We can't even imagine what those jobs are. Could someone at the turn of the century imagine uh, the type of city that we live in? We could start, we could start to, yeah, I mean, yeah, but What's, it'd be fun, but start to imagine. You know, <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> like, for example, like if, if auto is successful in its mission, like what kinds of things, what kinds of new jobs do you think? Well, like? so I, I think can imagine that, some, but I'd love to that, hear your thoughts. That's an interest, I, I mean, that's an interesting approach. Obviously, we're training people to instead of Become uh, become materials movers. They're now becoming, you know, uh, robot maintainers and robot fleet managers. So there's jobs there. Um, but I would also say that in, in my mind, that we will not see a net new job creation. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit again. There's I know there's a lot of opinions that say, oh look, you know, the internet or the industrial revolution created. Yes, jobs were destroyed, but also new jobs were created, and we had net growth. Um, I'm actually taking the position that if you know, myself and other people do our jobs, then you won't need, you won't need as many people to keep the world moving. So I think there, there needs to be, I, I've continued to feel very strongly that there needs to be consideration 
on a social aspect of what happens, um, you know, what happens with the retraining problem. Sure. For instance, we're going to start obsoleting jobs faster and faster and faster. What happens, you know, the prototypical uh, example is truck drivers. Yeah. Truck drivers cannot afford to go back to school, and it's actually reasonable to assume that 90% of truck driving jobs will disappear within a generation. Now, that will be, that will be a massive, massive shock to society if those and other jobs mm -hmm. disappear that quickly. So I think we also need to be looking at social, at, at various changes professors. to the social. We can make yeah, every, professors. Yeah, everyone can be professors. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it is kind of like with farming, right? It doesn't take nearly as many people mm -hmm. to keep the world fed. And so people had to not just get new jobs, but whole cultures or subcultures disappeared or changed. Massive movements of people from places where farming was good to do to other kinds of things. And I so think, we may um, see some of that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, think for, I think consumption, I mean, this may be taken as a challenge to some people, but consumption I feel has a natural limit on how fast you can consume yes. things. I mean, yeah. you're limited just by fundamentals of resource extraction and, you know, human, like I, I could buy an iPhone every year, but I don't. Yeah. Like there's certain fundamentals there as, as much as companies may want you to buy more, there are limitations there. But there, there's also ways of like create, I mean, I like to think about, I, I, I agree, I mean, you're, you're in the industry where you have to be most worried, <laughs> but there's also <laughs> ways in which your industry might create other kinds of jobs, oh, enable of things. Like I know someone who started in the Bay Area, a company for, she just started her own small business to do um, artisan baking of bread to order. So you, you order, she puts out different kinds of breads, and you order it the night before, she bakes it, and then she delivers it to your house. Now, she spends most of her time now driving around Silicon Valley <laughs> delivering bread to rich people's houses. She could do a lot more, and other people, you know, there's all sorts of, again, it's like the analog of the eBayers, right? There's, there's all sorts of people who might have something they'd like to do, right. and they could be enabled by these kinds of deliveries. There's right. no That's, doubt that there's going to be an enormous amount of disruption. There's yep. no doubt. But there's so much work that needs to be done now, even to train these agents. Yeah. Training bots is going to be something that's going to take a lot of time. I mean, you, might, you might be a whole class of bot trainers. Absolutely. Yeah. Bot so trainers. So bot absolutely true. Yeah, I think the thing to watch out for is uh, there's, certainly, there's certainly going to be new jobs that are, that are pretty obvious, mm -hmm. but those jobs are a different kind of job. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're talking about, um, you know, for example, uh, people who used to move stuff around, now now they're robot technicians, but those are, those are different Very kinds different of jobs. jobs. Right. And I think the same thing is true. You know, we can say we can build these, these specialized intelligence systems that can, mm -hmm. that can replace what, a lot of what humans do, and then there's new jobs going to be creating those intelligence systems. But those are completely different yeah, no, kinds no, of but, jobs. Right. Yeah. Very much. Um, but, uh, that's but, not as much what I'm talking about, but yeah. I think yeah, this, the, prob the, 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 the thing that's causing the problem is also going to be part of the solution, because part of it is, uh, is, is training and learning capabilities, right? Building customized learning programs that will ab understand your uh, skills, the gaps in your knowledge, your learning styles. In fact, that's some of the work that's being done now, including using robot simulation. So, so imagine the best teacher that you ever had in your, in your life, and imagine all the things that embody that teacher. That could be put into a program that understands how to engage with people, how to engage with the students. But I think it's going to be a motivated. long time before we have a program that's as good as the best teacher. Well, uh, sure. It's, it's <laughs> going to be a while. Teacher. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I just disrupted uh, myself, education here. If I'm he sorry. does say so himself. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but, we, but I do ne think never we're probably really going to have to rethink teachers, education. Because like you're saying, like, this is the first, I mean, one of the singularities that I think we are looking at, right, truck, the, the, what you just said about truck driving uh, is, is a great example, is you know, people, jobs have always been lost to technology, but now it's, it's maybe the first time in history where for many, many people, you can't just have this first phase of your life where you learn what you need to learn, and then the second phase right. of your life where you just use it, yes. right? You might, we might have to think about education and retraining as becoming much more of a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think honestly, we shouldn't, it's, we shouldn't have a, I think a, I don't know, whatever it is, it's a, you know, it's true that many people who've been truck drivers for a long time, they're certainly not going to be retrained to be AI scientists or robot maintainers. Probably not. But people are flexible and creative, and people adapt in all sorts of ways, and we should be looking for ways well, in our well, society and well, our technology to enhance well, there's, human there's flexibility. There's one interesting lesson from the Industrial Revolution. So when the artisans had their uh, uh, master-apprentice model, and they were doing their little shops, and back then there was no credit. There wasn't real capitalism. And there were traders that had money. Mm. And the first factories where they scaled, and they borrowed money, they got finance, they made everybody fungible, those were led by artisans. Mm. 
they were led by the experts who said, you know what? That looks like a better model. And they said, screw this thing. I'm firing all of you. You're coming back as paid workers, and you're going to be cogs in my machine. But it, but it wasn't a bunch of capitalists that came in and looked at the artists and said, I can do this better. It was the people who knew how to do it who then adopted capitalism and scale. And, it, it, and so, so my hypothesis here is that at the one hand, right now, we've got this sort of um, you know, super skilled machine learning AI tool builders right now that seem to be in charge. Mm -hmm. But it could be that once the tools and once the, uh, the, the technology becomes more prevalent, like it did with the internet, uh, because the early, like the, uh, the early ISPs were all built by people who were at the table when the standards were being created. That, you couldn't do that unless you're part of the club. But today, the internet startups are being created by anyone who has a peculiar idea that a normal engineer wouldn't have thought of. And so, so I feel like that the innovation yeah. curve may start to lean into people who have domain expertise once the infrastructure is built. Yeah. I totally agree. I think it's going to become the application of the tools to the problems rather than the tools and, themselves. And that's, I think that's the theory. And I, I want to actually ask one of the questions on, the, on this uh, tool that we have, Slido. Um, it says, um, would love to, uh, the panelists' thoughts on products such as Google DeepMind, IBM Watson, real names here. Um, um, are these solutions looking for problems? And what's the true effort uh, to yield value? And I think that, the, the, and I would sort of reframe that as is there sort of the idea of the perfect algorithm, the master of all AI that becomes the, the, the winner takes all, like, like the Amazons and the Googles? Is that the prevalent model? Or is it going to be kind of what we were leading up to earlier, which is once the tools become sort of available, the, the real value will be generated by domain experts. Do you guys have any thoughts? I, I have some thoughts. Um... Around around our field, um, you know, to some extent, these are these are solutions waiting for problems because they're designed that way, right? They're designed to be sort of a platform that you that you can that you can do learning on. But I think it's a fallacy to think that that learning is the whole problem. Uh, so the example that I wanted to give is in in our industry, there's a lot of talk about automated chatbots and and things replacing humans in the call center. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, well, with all, with all this, this AI back end, like you know, a Watson or a DeepMind or something, you know, we can train these chatbots to, you know, to serve customers as, as, as well as humans. But, um, but the problem is that that's not the, not, that's not the real problem that these call centers have. Uh, with automation, and I, I'll go back to something that, that you said earlier on, that there's no AI without uh, information I, architecture. Right, right, right. Their major problem is that there is that there's, uh, you know, for a lot of our customers, their major problem is that their, their systems aren't connected right. very well, and that's one of the functions of having the human on the phone mm. <laughs> is that they're, is yep. that they're mm. mitigating that. Because, because you understand, they, I need to connect you to someone else, or this is the wrong. Right, or, or they just have a bunch of different systems that they have different interfaces to, <laughs> and these, and so, you know, your chatbot, even if they're understanding what you're saying and they can try to figure out, um, you know, what to what to do about it, they, you're not, they can't do anything un, until everything is actually connected, and so, and so, companies right now today are dealing with a different a different set of problems, and and I think it has this. They have potential, but they require uh, the, uh, these, to these tools, um, uh, these sort of learning engines have potential, but they require that all of the data is there and connected and, and, and can communicate with them. Yeah. And that, they, and that, and that the, the structure of your problem fits the structure that they, uh, that they provide. Just on, on, you know, on that specific question, I think it's important that to, to recognize that Google's DeepMind and IBM Watson, these are not products, right? right. These are business units. They are the names of divisions <laughs> the of companies. They're yeah, they're brands. brands. They are yeah. brands. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the people who work for those units have some great tools that they've built, mm -hmm. um, which are you know, tools looking for problems that, again, I think together with domain experts, they will need to do. So DeepMind is applying their tools, for example, in health. And they have a whole health team. They hire doctors. I, I recently saw someone whose title is like, you know, senior clinician at DeepMind, right? Similarly, Watson, I, you know, IBM is looking very big at health. And, you know, they, work, they, they hire people who know a lot about health. 
Um, so, I, so you know, again, it's just it's just important to say that there there are no there are there is no like general master learning algorithm that DeepMind has. They have a lot of smart people who have built some interesting. Yeah. Tools. They do have and, a, an approach, though. They, right? right. So they they have an approach, and they they have they have an they do have some approaches that have more gravity than others, mm -hmm. right? And I would say, you know, in particular, where, where DeepMind has been the most successful, their approach, you know, they've been focusing on games. Mm -hmm. And the key there is things where you, you can basically simulate the world, whether it's the world of Atari or Go, you know, you can have a computer program and, and the ability to play a game with yourself and get into a self-improving uh, loop, that's partly what makes reinforcement learning work. And it's why their biggest so far publicly known success is in another thing that you can simulate, which is optimizing power usage in data centers, right? You can build simulators for that, so, and you, you can handle the risks of not overheating the place and, ca and calculate your gain. And so there, you know, for example, domains where you can simulate the system and it's just trying to solve a really hard optimization problem. Mm -hmm. That's, for example, where Google DeepMinds main technology is, is having the most impact in the short term. Whether health is like that is a, is a big open question, and I think realistically the things they're doing in health are probably much more basic kinds of machine learning things, not fancy deep RL at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would reiterate the, the point that uh, these are brands, yeah. and they're made of multiple components and multiple algorithms, and these are always changing. Right? Yes. Yeah. And they have to be applied to a specific problem. Uh, getting back to the, the idea of, of the chat bot for customer service, uh, why do we have customer service? Because something's screwed up. <laughs> something's not yeah. designed well, yeah. something's not working well, and the thing that we're trying to do is improve that, right? We're trying to go upstream with many, you know, RPA, ro robotic process automation, is going upstream and trying to connect some of those pieces together. So I think as we evolve and as organizations get better and they get better at these things, all of that stuff is gonna change, right? And there's not going to be a single problem. It, it is an ecosystem that evolves. And so just as these algorithms are made of, of other uh, routines and other components, all of those pieces will evolve as well. So there's never going to be one tool that's going to handle all of this. There will always be components that will change as your problem space changes. And when you think about a chatbot, a chatbot is just a channel. It's a channel. You still have to have the information. You still have to have the data. I talked to one vendor who said uh, I, they showed me how to configure the chatbot, and they showed me a list of question-answer pairs. I'm like, what? Really? <laughs> even with, with spelling uh, uh, like mistakes. <laughs> it's like, really? No, that's not, you're, not even, you're not even close. And, I, and they said, well, the customer has a knowledge base that we connect to. Really? The customer has a knowledge base. Let's assume a can opener. <laughs> anyway, it, it, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, a a problem that has to be solved at multiple levels, and again, there's always gonna be multiple tools, and the thing that you don't wanna do is get locked into a single vendor, because they'll say, give us uh, two, six months, $2 million in all your content, and we'll figure it out. And that's what some of those vendors will do. And then you're locked in, and what are they doing? They're training the AI. What are they training it with? Your content. So getting your house in order, and componentizing, and architecting, and getting that, that way you, you have portability across different environments because all those components are gonna change. All those solutions and algorithms are gonna change. And, and I do I think, I feel by like way, you've been you know, burned by this before. Something tells me. <laughs> no, I've watched a lot of clients get burned. We, and we, so. we just announced yesterday, this is sort of self-promoting, but um, uh, we're working with the Toyota Research Institute to try to get all the car vendors, and this is where I think academia can help, um, to come together with a consortium on how to share data, how to work with regulators, because a lot of this actually should be the customers coming together in consortia around fields on how to use data. Because I think one of the problems is some vendors um, will try to create a solution using the customer's data and then sell it to other customers. So that's a that's right. traditional management yep. consulting pattern. And I think that that's, not, that's suboptimal because it will, you know. And, that's and, a competitive advantage that you're yeah. losing suddenly. And, and, and I think in certain narrow areas that might work. But I think people aren't going to be easily sucked into that. And I think having some sort of consortia around that would be valuable. Um, I'm gonna go to the next question because it's kind of interesting as well. It says, humans are susceptible to prevailing systems of thought or habits of mind. How do we prevent AI technologies that are designing and building, um, that we are designing building to be susceptible to reinforce our own views? And let me add two examples. Um, again, using the Industrial Revolution history because we've been looking at that as I wrote my recent book. Um, 
So the steam engine was in the middle of the factory, and you had all these pulleys and axles and things that moved all of the machines. So there was power that was then mechanically moved around the factory. And when the electric motor was invented, what did they do? They replaced the one. steam yeah. engine, but they kept it in the middle of the factory. It took decades before they realized they could make smaller motors. And then it took even more time before they realized they could put motors in each of the machines and assemble the machine line based on function and, it just, and, and distribute the electricity instead. And so what's interesting is that we always try initially to just retrofit these pieces. And I think that's normal. But, it, but the, I think the amount of time it takes to get your head around what a new technology can do for the fundamental design of the whole thing is usually a long time. Mm. And then the other piece I would add is, and this is an area of work that we're doing, and this ties to like the, 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 the judiciary, is we're, we're finding that, that the data is as biased as we are. And we are just reinforcing our own biases. And even when we try to eliminate biases, um, it's very hard because we're not aware of our own biases. One of our students realized that one of the libraries used in almost in, in a huge number of computers for face recognition um, can't see dark colored faces. You know, it just turns out there were no dark, dark colored face people working on the problem, so they couldn't test it. You know, where Julia Anglin's paper on, on the judiciary found that these risk scores, even though they don't, they don't ask you race, there's the one da data set that she looked at was systemically biased against um, black people and nearly random for white mm -hmm. people, right? So, so what, what's interesting is that as we augment our society, we're just doing more of the same. And it's actually a very, it's, it's sort of, it's a very high level question about what, uh, what do we really want to do here? Because the, the problem is, and this gets to sort of ethics and morals in society, is that um, the market by nature isn't really trying to become more moral. Um, and the system we have right now, the, the ethics and things like that, the, 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 regula reg the self-regulation or the regulatory processes. The market isn't becoming what? I'm sorry. Moral. It's not like, incentivized, it's, it's not incentivized okay. necessarily. Okay. Now, now we can talk about triple bottom line and all this other stuff, but, okay. but we, we clearly aren't actively uh, prioritizing ethics and morals. And there was a recent study by, uh, 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 at, 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 the, at the School of Management you know, after an hour of asking business leaders what's an important attribute of a business leader, um, ethics never came up as, <laughs> as one of the things, right? So, Clearly it's so, not so important. Now, now it's, it's, it's not like that's the, I mean, that's the function of the market, yeah. and I think one of the problems is whose job is it to ask these questions? So I don't know if it's a, it's a big Yeah, it's a big Can thing. Can I say something yeah. about, to address a few of the things you said? Yeah. So, it's a really big problem, and I want to, I mean, the problem of how do we prevent systems from reinforcing systemic biases or our, our preconceptions, our habits of mind. And I want to link it back to this issue of sharing data and data sets and how data sets are designed. More and more when I look at these, at, at systems that are being deployed, like in IBM Watson or in Google for, say, image understanding, it's really astonishing how much they are prisoners of the data set they were trained on, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of uh, uh, news in the last year or two about machine vision systems which do image captioning, which look at an image and write a description in terms that look, that look like way, the way a human would do this. Um, but it turns out, there's, you know, IBM has a version of this online, and so does Microsoft, and Google has at different times. All of these systems basically at this point do the same thing because they were all trained on the same data set. This was a data set that convinced, it was originally developed by some Microsoft researchers who now work for Facebook and others. But, so there's a whole ecosystem of internet companies here. And they've convinced themselves, and, and in some sense convinced everyone, that these systems reach nearly human level description. But, and the way they do that is they, help, they hold out some of the data set for a test data set. They train the algorithms on the training set and then show, look, they match humans on the test set. But the test set and the training set, are really, they really just came from the same thing. Somebody built a certain data set. And if you take it outside of the parameters that constructed the data set, test or training, doesn't matter, to just random images on the web, it's almost embarrassing how poorly they do. Right. <laughs> okay, right. um, And you can just check this out for yourself online. Mm -hmm. um, there are Twitter bots that upload random images from Wikimedia Commons to these caption bots. And you know, they're, 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 they, about you know, a small fraction of the time, maybe 10, 20%, they do something reasonable. And they, it's just embarrassing how many things they don't see or how many mistakes they make. Embarrassing to us, to, to the field of AI researchers. Mm -hmm. but, so this speaks to a number of things. It means that we're, all of our algorithms, for all sorts of reasons, certainly for ethical reasons, but also just for engineering reasons, the, the, the current things that are being deployed, these pattern recognition systems, they just 
fill in the gaps in, in and around the data they already have. So if we want them to be more and more intelligent, more and more flexible, more and more ethical, we're gonna have to keep expanding. The data sets have to get bigger. We have to be smarter about where, where we get these data sets from. And I think that's just the main thing to keep in mind going forward. So I think we're getting the hook, right? You wanna say the last, have the last so word? Mm -hmm. I, I would take, I mean, if I look at reinforcing our own views, it does come down to diversity of data sets, but I mean, companies are not made up of, like companies don't really run on their own. There are, there are senior people at organizations who can have significant influence, whether these are engineering, whether it's in IT, whether it's in business operations. So I think we, we talk about the world trending to be, there's no pressure to trend the world to be more moral. That's true, but I'd also argue in, in many cases, there's no pressure trending the world to be less moral. Like, I haven't really come across many, I, I mean, well. we're, um, uh, there's, You live there's in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, there's, okay. there's a Canadian bias here. True. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but what I would put forward to everyone. You your company to Uber, right? Uh, pardon? Yeah. <laughs> Never Pardon? Heard. Didn't you sell one of your companies to Uber? Uh, no, okay. I would encourage you to contact <laughs> okay. trademarks at uber.com. Okay. I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. um, but what I would put forward in terms of diversity is for everyone here who, everyone here has that power to influence mm -hmm. the data sets that you're using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This isn't something that we need to all, like collectively, these are some, we're all some of the best directors of IT and CIOs and CTOs in the world sitting in this room, so are we all gonna throw up our hands and say, well, I guess it's the data set's fault, there's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. No, let's actually go out and build diverse data sets mm -hmm. and go forward, um, go even beyond that and build diverse teams mm -hmm. and have that understanding so that kind of embarrassing facial recognition thing doesn't happen again. Uh, that's a very good note to end on. Mm -hmm. Thank that's you guys great. very much. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.